Some people believe the Beta Cassius planet to have mystical healing powers. The Alcyons were believed to have destroyed the last of the Torellian ships. And Deanna Troy's father actually knew Steve Miller. I think he was the bass player. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton and Denise Crosby, triumphantly returning from the Star Trek cruise, by the way. We made yeah. it, we made it <laughs> from we the did. love boat. The love boat landed. And uh, my name is Ryan yeah. T. Huss. Today we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation, Season 1, Episode 10, Haven, story by Tracy Torme and Lan Okun, teleplay by Tracy Torme, directed by Richard Compton. Uh, this was November 28th, 1987. And Big thanks to Grandpa One, a.k.a. Tim Baum, for sponsoring this entire season. What is up? How are you doing? Actually, first things first, as a big Star Trek fan, Denise, I just want to ask you, just to get this whole thing started, this is the first episode of Luoxana Troy. Can you tell us, you obviously met Major Roddenberry. What was she like? Oh my God. Well, she came in with a force of like a force of nature, <laughs> embodying this character and, you know, just never, never let up. Um, she was just had such a presence, you know, and um, I just thought it was really clever that she was cast in this role. I thought it was um, uh, you know, uh, definitely stunt casting, but but yeah. worked tremendously. I had uh, I had previously met Majel completely um, apart from Star Trek. I was doing a play in LA, a very very popular play called Tamara, and um, we were doing eight shows a week, and in between the Sunday matinee and the Sunday evening performance, a bunch of us would go over to the Cock and Bull restaurant on Sunset Boulevard, and we'd have oysters in between um, shows, sort of our treat and a little boost. And Majel, every Sunday evening, would sit at the bar by herself and have oysters. Mm. And so we began to know this woman, get to know this local, you know, who would was there at the same time. And she opened up to us that she was um, her her husband was Gene Roddenberry. He had created Star Trek. And we went, oh, yeah, of course. And so about a year later, I get cast as Tasha Yar and, um, you know, get to know her through this and reminded her of our meetings at the Cock and Bull on Sunday evenings. <laughs> that's so cool wow. i had no idea i know small little world i'm mm -hmm. telling you that's a small world um i will say that majel has been always very sweet when i've been around her she was very kind very lovely um and always um eager to do the work and be there that from what i understood she, i didn't feel like a reluctancy or this was something that she was bothered by. I felt like this is what she wanted to do. She wanted to be in these scenes. She wanted to be in these episodes. Yeah. And she approached it with that kind of passion and, and fervor. Yeah. But, but what I noticed about this episode, specifically, I was reminded of Lucille Ball. Hmm. And there are comparisons to me to how Majo plays this character and Lucille Ball, this kind of, you know, pushy, um, you know, I'm going to do things my way. And I think there's also an irony in the true story of her, her life, you know, also being married to Gene Roddenberry and Lucille Ball being married to uh, Desi, who was a, yeah producer and she was always trying to get in his acts and so mm -hmm. i feel like i feel a parallel to majel trying to get in these acts and i'm not saying that that's why it happened but it, there is a similarity there in when i look at it from this kind of um hindsight perspective right 
Right. Well, and she does play it with that, you know, screwball comedy yes. sort of energy. You know, she's just so cute. camping it up and, mm -hmm. and you know, working, working the the sexual angle, the comedic uh, angle. And, you know, there's there's never really a moment of of sort of depth or straight man about it at all you know it's just at you know high up here the whole level of the performance which mm -hmm. lucy of course was always at as well right so there's yeah. there's similarities in the performance that she's that that kind of reminds you of a lucille ball you know and the uh follies and the the, the comedy there that she she brings to the table as well right. um but I also will say, from my perspective, I don't, I didn't know uh, her character's backstory. And yep. when I met her, she was the one flirting with Odo, and mm. that was that's pretty much all I knew about her going into this episode. And so when I'm watching this, and I realize, oh, that's Counselor Troy's mother. <laughs> and that like that <laughs> like, so that wasn't how, clear with, with I don't know how I did not oh. put that together I, ah. I get the oh wow name, I didn't realize but, that but just the first time I'm understanding that because they didn't make that distinction on Deep Space Nine from what I understand watching it they didn't um and they don't act similarly say that. like she doesn't act like Troy at all right. in fact uh if I remember correctly Marina at uh convention several years ago once you know mentioned and pointed out the fact that she worked on her accent she worked on creating this character of deanna troy with with an accent that over enunciates a bit and sounds a little british right and then her mom comes along he's just like oh hey what's up everybody hey uh let's uh, do crazy <laughs> stuff and she's like what the heck why did i create this whole and then she's like and then i was well, stuck for seven years with this weird accent <laughs> except except um loxana does comment on her accent mm -hmm. in this episode says you know when i hear you speak it reminds me of your father so what what i get right there is oh so even though her her father's human, um, which I had forgotten mm -hmm. that Deanna was half human, um, that uh, oh he must that that's how he spoke. So so it kind of explains right. explains this accent in some way. Very right. Very true. Yeah, yeah I didn't know that. Um, I was surprised. It's like oh, so that's where it comes from, and. The, once those things started to click, I actually um, I realized, oh, this is the this was the first appearance of Major Roddenberry in, in the show, right? As yes. Loxana Troy, she played a couple characters in the original series. First of which I believe yeah. was number one, uh, the one that's played by Rebecca Romain right now in uh, in Captain Pike. What's it called? Strange New Worlds, um, right. and then also Nurse Chapel. I think it was. These guys are going to skewer me if I'm wrong. Uh, but I'm pretty sure it was Nurse right. Chapel and and Janice Rand was Grace Lee Whitney, I think. Um, but yeah, this is the introduction of that character. And you know, it's got to be just Gene Roddenberry saying, all right, how do we get her back into this show? And he clearly wrote a character based on his wife uh, because she obviously was the perfect actress to play this character you know it felt like it was kind of molded around her is what it seems like having never met her but actually denise you met her was that her personality kind of friendly and and making jokes and being very comfortable with everybody yes i mean for the most part you know this was this was you know this was major on steroids a little bit i mean she wasn't you know that mm -hmm. kind of anti mamish in everybody's <laughs> in everybody's stuff and everybody's face but yeah she was very she was she was present and available and warm and um you know always engaging and big personalities very tall very tall mm -hmm. so very very present and um she yeah she wasn't she certainly wasn't a wallflower by any means you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, 
uh, she was a socialite too. She liked to host parties at her house, and she oh, sent. Yeah, I remember getting invitations on a you know regular basis for a Halloween or a Christmas party that she would throw, and um, I was unable yeah. to make it. But I was very uh, kind of her to invite me and to you know include me. So she was always trying to um, reach out to people and, and be a socialite and. Like uh, Denise was saying, I, I don't remember seeing her huddled in the corner, like not talking <laughs> to people. She no, she, she was, was very always social, talking. very yes. very social. They had they were members of a country club. You know, they would go and you know have cocktails and dinners and play golf and and you know very 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 much out and about. Oh, that's yeah. so cool. That's so great. There's so many people out there that are huge fans of hers that never got to meet her. So I know they're going to be really soaking this up. Um, I mean, there are some people that have flatly said she is their favorite character in all of Star Trek ever. Wow. So, Luaxana? Luaxana? Yeah. so okay. clearly that kind of personality type, you know, the Lucille Ball personality type, the Luaxana Troy really resonates with a lot of people, uh, one of which is actually our associate producer, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel. And I think she'll be in the free-for-all later so she can explain why. Uh, but that was really cool. I was happy to see her so early on in this series because as a fan and not having seen any of this stuff for like 20 years myself, um, I forget how early on she was introduced. I was like, wow, she was in the 10th episode? Uh, yeah. We're barely getting to know everybody else. And and then we had, by the way, this was Armin Shimmerman, his actual, no. how he mentioned, yeah, this was his acting debut yeah. in Star Trek. Remember how he said the first thing that he did for Star Trek was to be the face in the box. And then after that, they shot uh, The Last Outpost. So even yeah, though this was, this was episode 10 and he appears wow. first in episode four, this was shot first. This was his first Star Trek role. Oh God! The one no, and only. I see it. Right, oh, yeah, he changed his voice. Him. Him. You couldn't recognize his <laughs> yeah. voice either. No, I knew it was Armin. I saw, I saw it because I just saw, I just finished seeing him, so I recognized the face. Oh, wow, right really? Away. I did yeah. not. I, I was like, not. Armin is the box. <laughs> <laughs> he even like dis disguised his voice in a way. Like I, I, I yeah. knew it was him, and I was still like, wow, that doesn't sound like him at all. Yeah. Um, wow. I forgot. It was, that. It, yeah. Like, yeah. It was amazing. Uh, uh, special effects for that box transformation right there. It was <laughs> high end. But I, I thought it was funny. <laughs> I think he's called it high end. <laughs> it was a high end uh, transformation. Uh, but I did in, enjoy the, um, the whole jewels coming out of it. And even at the end, when they said, you can keep the chest, I'm like, that would, no. that would be good. Like, you want me to keep no. that? Don't leave it in the bathroom, man. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's... There were, there were that's, some serious uh, jewels in there. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking, no, I do not want to keep the chest that talks to me like that. That's... No, I'm not interested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you don't want to be caught talking to a chest. People get mad at that. Um, <laughs> with good reason... Uh, one other person I want to point out is, uh, I believe his last name is pronounced Stroiken, Carol oh. Stroiken, Mr. Home. He was mm -hmm. the tall, uh, I think Dutch actor. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. Stroiken seems Dutch. And, mm -hmm. um, we did hear him speak once, but I always thought he was like the predecessor, Sirach, to my hard do. Remember uh, the tall, kind of wrinkly face guy that would come with Grand Negus Zek? He always had his mm -hmm. super tall alien manservant mm -hmm. like this guy was. And I was like, I always wish those two guys had met each other because they were both seven foot tall alien characters that didn't speak, but they were just kind of like a, a servant yeah. or a guardian or assistant mm -hmm. or something to somebody, you know, royal. Um I don't know if you made that connection, but it was good to see him. I always liked him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can we can set up the bout between the two of them. It would be <laughs> a great match to see who's the the stronger, taller servant. Um, <laughs> the thing that was funny to me about that was the whole Captain Picard carrying the bags. 
troll, you know, the kind of joke that we're trying to play with that. Mm -hmm. And to see him struggling with that uh, briefcase or the suitcase. And then mm -hmm. to see the other guy just pick it up so easily, uh, you know, uh, it was a nice little moment there. It was showing that he was, you know, concerned and, and wanted to show uh, gratitude to uh, yeah. Counselor Troy's and mother. And then when he found out that it was Holmes' job, he's like, oh, please yeah. don't let me keep you from doing your duty. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Like, let me get out of this. <laughs> but actually, uh, Denise, so I don't know if you met uh, Carol. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like you did have one or two scenes with him. Was he just yeah. uh, super quiet? Yes, very, very polite, very, um, you know, so striking in his appearance. I mean, I have seen him and, you know, do other things um, over the years. I I, I had. Lurch. I think he played Lurch in one of the well, Adams family. I was just going to say, yeah. I mean, he re he's reminding me of Lurch. Yeah. So, yes, that's probably why. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the whole, the whole thing was, was very colorful. That whole sequence shooting that party, you know, they had ex the plates of the weirdest food and, and, and they, they were trying to put together and just all these colorful outfits, everybody's, you know, wearing and, and how about my hairdo? My God, it looks like I stuck my finger in an electrical shop. You were dry. You drove to work in a convertible that day. Oh, I totally. I mean, I, I, you know, like very eighties. God, you know, I should be like with the Go Go's at the, you know, on stage or something. Um, it was. I went. Oh my God, you know, it was just out there. Um, mm. You know, but but it, in the eighties, they loved it. They're like, oh my, actually. I was going to mention this earlier, but uh, Deanna Troy's hair in the in the later half of the episode was actually really good. Like, I don't notice. I'm not good with hair. Yeah. I'm the worst at that. I just put a hat on so I don't have to do anything with my hair. But like, I was like, damn, Deanna Troy's hair is fire right now when it was all up and in this long ponytail. Yeah, thing. yeah. It looked, it looked really, really good. It, yeah, they were trying, you know, obviously I looked at all of our party hairdos, you know, Gates had something going on. I didn't, you know, big, yeah, wrapped like, around kind of weird roll thing going. And I look like a, you know, an electrified poodle. And, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I mean, we're all sort of got our fancy party hair on, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I was, I noticed the hair too. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. I was looking at Gates' hair because I guess you said it was rolled in the back because it was short and it yeah. looked really short. And then the yeah, next scene was really long. But okay. you know, I'm noticing now, and and again, this is this is coming back to me. Um, there was a there was a lot of except for me. I mean, I had just, you know, that cut was 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 my hair, you know, that that was that was the yar haircut. But the girls were really trying to find this their hair in this in this sequencing of shows. You if you watch now. Gates has different hair each episode at this point. Oh you know? yeah, I didn't notice that. And it's thicker, it's it's sometimes it's a wig, sometimes it's not a wig. It's like they're they're trying to find who they are in this in this period right now. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Yeah, mm -hmm. when I first saw uh Beverly Crusher's hair when it was changed, my first thought was, whoa, did they cut her hair? Did I not notice? Yeah, that's what I, I my, thought. I, I was just like, did I seriously not notice that they cut her hair this episode? But then I saw that it was just kind of like rolled up into like a cinnamon bun in the back or something like that. Yeah, something going on there. But but even when her hair's down, when she's in like the ready room, mm -hmm. it that it's darker. It's, a, it's a, I believe it's a wig at this point. And, you know, it's a whole whole thing that everybody's trying. But I remember I remember during the series that it, it there was there was hair struggles going on. Do I do, do I do that? It's like, what what is going on here with the hair? We can't quite lock into something and they're trying different things. Lock in the locks. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to just uh, switch pace on the uh, to topic a little bit. Mm -hmm. There it is. <laughs> there it is. 
But, you know, the storyline between uh, Jonathan Frakes, between number one and Counselor Troy, it seems like, and they haven't given us enough backstory for the amount of front story that I see in this episode. And so I know that there's something there. They mentioned that in the pilot. There was that moment when they met each other. There was the, but they never showed them since then flirting with each other that much or even dating um, yeah. or, or having a, in, like a romantic in-depth conversations. Um, you know, you would think that they would expand on that a little bit more. It's kind of in the gray area at this point. And so when I see the jealousy that Frakes, I mean, <laughs> that he has in this episode, I'm like, whoa. Um, You're like, well, you never did anything about it, dude. So yeah, like, hey. I, <laughs> what yeah, are you mad I about? <laughs> You'd be mad right. at yourself. Kinda. It has. It's not <laughs> earned. It's not warranted at this point. It's. It's. You know, we're just leaping into you know a huge um, uh, assumption here. That, you know, there's these deep, deep um, passion and love and Imzadi and beloved and but we're, we don't see any of it. None of yeah. it has been there. Has there been an example of? We only got a hint of it, if I remember, uh, in the first episode when they kind of meet each other and they have this thing. But I don't mm -hmm. think from episode one to episode 10, there were any other hints that I can remember. There was the introduction. And then they there left it alone. And then looks. there was Riker throwing a little tantrum in this episode. <laughs> yeah, there were a couple yeah. of looks they've exchanged throughout the time. They've yeah, given maybe. each other looks, little light looks, nothing verbal. And the thing about it is that as a counselor who has this ability to read minds, you would think that that would exactly be the difficult conversation that she would call out. She would say, you're avoiding talking to me about this because of this. And that's exactly how the conversation would start because, you know, obviously she knows what the deal is. Right. Can you imagine if yeah. your significant other can read your mind all the time? Oh, God. That There'd would... be no significant other. <laughs> yeah, I, we there wouldn't, wouldn't be last such a, week. a thing as... You wouldn't last <laughs> a week. I would have no been busted so many times it wouldn't have even been funny. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you said you liked the green shirt. I do. Right. <laughs> Don't call me a jerk. Yeah. You know? yeah. I didn't. <laughs> yes, you did. Yeah. Oh, Do yeah, I look fat sure. in this? Uh, yeah. Nope. <laughs> oh, God. Um, oh, you think she's prettier than me, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It would just never stop. Yeah. It would never stop. It no, would be an I endless know. confrontation. But you <sighs> would think that would be the that would be the joke running between yeah. the two of them. I think that what we're talking about could have been explored and it could always be, oh, you're looking at her. Oh, what is this? Oh, this is on your mind. Oh, you, you know, you want to, whatever it is, she could always be using that against, um, against the character. Even little subtle things. Like imagine if just something happens, right. And, and Riker just kind of looks at, at, at Troy and she just kind of goes, I know will, or just, like a little thing there where she, there's like that acknowledgement of that connection, you know? Yeah. Or even mm -hmm. in this episode, there was room for the writers to, when they were alone having this conversation and she says, you know, I know your, your number one, you know, desire in life is to be a captain of a starship. And he says, well, there's other things. I mean, right then and there is the opening for the conversation of, I know, I know, Will, that you, you have you you have feelings, feelings. and yes. you know like they, like it, they get into it right talk then and about there. it they it, don't it talk stays, about in it in this awkward space yeah by them not talking about it it makes it worse yeah and and by her being a counselor that's exactly her skill set literally right. talking about it well then and how about when when wyatt shows up on the moonscape and they're the mm -hmm. two of them are together barges in i call yeah. them barging in by the way yeah. that you made me knock. really uncomfortable like yeah. what's going on oh, oh well wait a minute you're you're the you're i mean she's clearly said she's felt somebody something for somebody on this ship mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And it's like nothing is ever like said. You know, it's like too bad, is... buddy. Too bad, buddy. Kick rocks. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. and the Riker's like, well, I guess, I guess I'll show myself out. And she's like, please do, Will. Yeah. Please do. Really <laughs> awkward. That that just felt like this is not. No, this is not what should be happening right now. Well, speaking of awkward, here's an awkward transition. Uh, we got to take a quick break, <laughs> everybody. Uh, and we'll talk more about this episode on the other side. This is Tasha Yar with the regular hair. Uh, we'll be right back on the seventh rule. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the seventh rule with Sirach Lofton and Denise Crosby. Yeah, hello. Here, here hello, they come. Greg. The trivioids of the week. I know everybody's been dying for these. We've got some people believe the beta Cassius planet to have mystical healing powers. Riker enjoys watching the Harp Twins. I don't know if you guys noticed that. Troy's father actually knew Steve Miller. Riker wants to be a starship captain more than anything. Deanna Troy is not what Wyatt was expecting. Mr. Zelo's thoughts became truly pornographic. Uh, Riker thought the Torellians were all dead. The Alcyons were relieved or were believed to have destroyed the last of the Torellian ships. And Mr. Hom keeps banging a gong. All right. I didn't realize that rhymed until I said it. It almost does, at least. <laughs> anyway, um, I did confirm, by the way, in the break that, yeah, it was uh, Nurse Chapel. And number one was who uh, Major Roddenberry played. She also did the voice of the ship's computer as well. And so that's really cool that in Strange New Worlds, we have two different actors playing roles that Majel uh, originally portrayed, which is a lot of fun and really cool. Anyway, back to where we uh, were. Yeah, so back to where we were. I'm going to comment on the heart playing ladies and tie it, us, tie it back to where we were. <laughs> um, Riker watching the heart playing porn. I mean, the heart playing ladies. <laughs> porn. <laughs> Porn section. Oh yeah, it, it it felt a little soft core to me, and it felt like you know that's you know your own business, brother. You know, do what you want, but um, instead of sitting there doing that, man, why don't you spend that time you know, telling? No, 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 not the holiday. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, no, telling Troy how you feel about her. You know, spend some time in the real world telling this woman, you know, how you feel right. about her. That's what I that's, think. Uh, that's maybe that's perfect, why. That would have been the, the perfect setup because we don't know yet what's about to take place. So if they right. had you'd given them a scene to yeah. you know connect with, then right. it makes it really it really ramps up, you know, the 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 energy for what's about to take place. Like what if she showed yeah. up at that point and she's like, Will, I just want to talk. Oh. Will, is this what you do? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, like, you yeah. are going to marry some other guy. So what else can I do? <laughs> well, I thought, I thought the same, you know, again, when you, you know, it opens up that way with him, I just thought, you know, it's just that more of that lechy kind of thing we saw in Justice when he's all like, you know, hot and bothered and wants to go down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just like, who, who is this guy? You know, when he wants yeah. to go down to the planet and, you know, have some more, not that. <laughs> 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 and I realized I need to finish my sentence there. Yeah. Um, yeah but, <laughs> but <laughs> Ooh, wait a minute. You're a mother, my God. What are you talking about? Um, so yeah, it's exactly it 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 just was that that lasciviousness, that thing that we're seeing uh, with Riker that I don't know. I mean, yes, of course he's a he's a healthy, sensual man, but you know what? I don't know. It's just I think it's an, a missed opportunity. You're right, Sirak, to be talking with with Troy. Set this up. I, you know what I liked yeah. was that I also thought was a little bit of a missed opportunity was the rose that kept changing color, right? And then after about 20 minutes of that, they moved on from the rose. And I thought that, you know, because they had the box, which was an interesting thing. Then they had the rose, which changes colors. And then they just kind of shifted over to 
other stuff. And I'm maybe it wasn't a missed opportunity, but I personally would have enjoyed a little bit more payoff for introduce. Otherwise, it was just like a little gimmick of like, check out this interesting thing. And I'm like, yeah, I'm checking it out. What I, I want to see more of it. Where, where does this tie in? You know, because it did. We actually saw it. And I don't know how they did that with the effects. But we all we saw it change from white to blue. And I did well, try to blue it. to white. Right. When he walked mm -hmm. on, it was blue and gives it to her and it becomes white. And do we ever see it again? We did. Like when she's walking through the hall, she's holding it. It's white. And then they have some kind of confrontation and we actually see it change from white to blue. And it was a really cool effect. And I was wondering how they did that back in 1987. Uh, but that was kind of the end of it as far as I know. Did we see it after mm -hmm. that? I don't think so. I don't. You're right. It's like yeah. it's introduced and 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 then nothing becomes of it. It was just cool. You know, Something like, I kind of stuck yeah. to. I I enjoyed the uh, first of all the ship that the design of the ship that they found with the kind of mm -hmm. glowing sphere in the middle of it. I thought that was a cool ship design. Um, but I couldn't stop but and help but think about uh, the transparent skull, Captain Bodine. Is that what his name was? Oh, Captain Boday. Good knowledge. Yeah, Captain, Captain Boday. Boday. Yeah, I felt like it was like he would be the pilot of that ship. <laughs> it did have like a transparent kind of thing to it. Um, but I did like the design. The other thing I really liked was when um, Counselor Troy finally got fed up with her mom because her mom just went over the top at, at that uh, table at the conversation and she went over and knocked that bell over yeah you were waiting for that oh my <laughs> god that's when i was like i was like that's marina right there she she yeah. nailed that mm -hmm. that's I... that's when she came out and said i'm i'm gonna break out a little bit of marina on you and <laughs> you know give me a piece of my mind. I loved that moment. I was laughing. I had to play that back. What about when, uh, when Loxana Troy calls out, uh, Wyatt's dad and me like, is like, well, this guy's been imagining me naked. All he's yeah. very excited about that. Uh, what the <laughs> heck? Yeah. <laughs> and then later on when the guy says we compromise when Wyatt's telling Deanna Troy, we compromise, we'll still be naked. And Troy's like, okay. And he's like, and your mother, and my father, but not my mom. I was like, whoa, 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 stop. <laughs> Did you just say <laughs> Troy's mom and your dad, the guy yeah. that you that, that yeah. she yeah. said wants to be naked with her, they're yeah. gonna be naked. And Wyatt's mom's gonna be like, okay, sweetie, you could be naked with her. I'll be fully clothed. That's a good, right. that's a, yeah, that's <laughs> I was like, wait, did I hear right. that right? Yeah, <laughs> they're swingers. We I now guess. know that they're have... swingers and that, <laughs> yeah. you know, that Wyatt's dad is practicing his nakedness, you know, in the, <laughs> in the, in the mirror, you know, he's going to, wants to look, wants to look hot, you know, for uh, Loxana. Practicing being naked doesn't make you look better naked. <laughs> yeah. He could, he could practice all week. It's not going to work. I don't yeah. know. I just thought that was not, not the best compromise. I feel like the mom might've been like, no, we'll, we're keeping our clothes on but <laughs> both of us. <laughs> right right how about when i liked the little aside that data had with mr home about you know the way you're the way you're drinking you must have some sort of human uh <laughs> quality it was just like a little <laughs> dig at you know i mean those that they uh those writers like to to kick back a few back then and there so did they well i mean i don't yeah. know about I don't know about uh, particularly um, uh, these script writers, but I mean, there there definitely was a culture of in the '60s with Star Trek of some serious drinking. Hmm. Yeah. Big surprise there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I um, think it all makes you sense. You know, but I I don't think it would be fair to do this reveal without me bringing up the um, idea of arranged marriages. And I think that being the, I guess, central tenant of this script and what this yeah. episode is about in mm -hmm. arranged marriages and um, arranged love when it's uh, versus 
naturally developing love, I guess. Is that right? Right. Is that what what you what the takeaway for you guys was? Hmm. I didn't really like. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm kind of trying to. Yeah, think I didn't. About it I'm mulling it over really too. The only theme, really, that we can we can talk right. about. I mean, there is some of the prime directive in, instilled in there when they're they're confronted with how how do they, you know, obviously this virus is on the way to Haven, and you know, mm -hmm. they how do they interfere? Mm -hmm. um, right. So that's that's touched upon. Um, but yeah, um, and also the theme of Wyatt's determination to, he sets it up that all he wants to do is cure, you know, as Riker wants to lead a, 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 a starship, all he wants to be is to be able to cure people. So, mm -hmm. you know, here is this, this very layered complex way he's going to do i mean he's sacrificing himself for this for not mm -hmm. only love for a really a really deep rooted manifestation of his love that is otherworldly in its in its you know conviction that he's seen this one woman you know his whole life and and she him you mm -hmm. know, via the pictures all over the ship. So, you know, with this, this in, is what an extreme connection of two souls that have act that are at, that actually manifest each other. Mm -hmm. Is love can love be that much? Mm -hmm. it sounds mythological, right. like an old, like a mythological yeah. story of yes, two yeah. characters that just had they their paths had to cross. And they had both dreamt it. Now, like yeah. use the term manifesting. Were they predicting the future or were they manifesting it right. to happen? Right, right. Right. And then it falls in line with when, what they establish in the beginning, which is that people go there to be healed. They go to Haven to be healed. Mm -hmm. And so our, our mm. initial interpretation of that is that you have to be on the surface of the planet and engage in the people's customs and rituals to be healed but maybe the journey to go to there is what heals you not necessarily being there right. and that was part of the story for this these people as they went there and found what they were looking for as far as their own healing right, right. Um, that is more meaningful you know symbol yeah. of healing Haven. Yeah. And mm -hmm. just the word Haven, right. you know, safe Haven. And yeah. I thought it was a beautiful love story between those two characters. I didn't buy the love between Troy and this Wyatt character. I just didn't feel like she was into him. <laughs> I did, I can, she was you know, trying I, to convince she, herself she, to be, it seemed. Yeah. She was trying to convince herself and, but I just didn't feel it. It just didn't, right. it didn't connect that way. And did they, at no point would, did she sell me on that? It could be possible. Right. It almost right. felt like he wasn't mature enough for her. For, it, that's what I felt like. It felt like he was too, not mature enough for her. Right. He seemed a lot more, um, at a place in life where he's trying to discover who he is and she's he more of a, you know, centered kind of, I know who I am already. So that's, that didn't make their paths kind of um, believable for me. Mm. He right. Gave nor kind nor of, did uh... I feel it from him, you know, mm -hmm. that, that he was into her. He was trying yeah. to get there. He was like, you know, they were telling themselves that, that right. this is what it's, it's supposed to be. be. But right. it's, what, you know, we can't get out of this. We're going to try and make this work. You know, I mean, even when they said, she said, we're going to be spending um, a lot of time with one another, his his line is, well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's what marriage is about. <laughs> and and thought about like, it? <laughs> oh, my God. That's not reassuring, right? Yeah, that's really not what I needed. You know, wow. <laughs> that. Yeah, well, let's sign a contract. Have, Sell, yeah. Yeah, I mean, right. It's like a mortgage or something. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I feel yeah, like that's I was a buying toughie. a mortgage. It's a tough one. Yeah. And and as you were saying that earlier, Srock, he it made me think he kind of gave off 
early season Julian Bashir vibes. Like he's just mm-hmm. excited to be there, but he's still kind of like young and wet behind the ears and all that. But yeah, the the arranged marriage thing is something I don't know much about. I know that they still happen in some cultures in our world, uh, our own world. And so, you know, I can't really judge on it too much. I mean, I could never, I feel like I could never do it, but I'm sure that's just because I was raised in a country where that doesn't happen. Right. But I, it does feel right. like those two were both pretty resigned to it. Like they didn't put up too much of a fight and they ended up kissing towards the end, which I did not expect them to just be like, well, you know, I guess they're not really that bad looking. And they just kind of start smooching. And then his line at the end, he's like, by the way, you are really beautiful, especially when we did this. Mm. I was like, well, that's weird. <laughs> right? like, it even, it was like, he's like, you were really, you were so beautiful when we did this. Mm. I know. <laughs> Yeah. In front that of was... mom. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, there was an interesting notion presented, and it, it kind of scurried over it when Riker and Troy are alone on that uh in that scape, that landscape. Um he she mentioned something about the human heart, it being so small that it can't contain romantic and platonic love at the same Mm -hmm. time Mm -hmm. which is what which i thought was a really kind of an interesting concept to to go into and 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 it was sort of dropped you know it was yeah like how do you know what is what are we able to can i love you and love him and how much love can the human heart experience i don't need to cancel one to have the other and which one is which yeah uh riker and wyatt between those two which one is the romantic and which one is the platonic because i can't really tell at this point right yeah and the fact that she's calling him beloved and he's saying dude you can't call me beloved at the same time as you're marrying this guy and she's like Hey, why not? We're, you know, what? what's, right. oh, I guess humans I can. can't hang with that. Well, kind of no. <laughs> yeah. like, there's that something, there's the, definitely something inappropriate it wasn't there. It was explained feels. further. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Maybe she's capable of loving more and she could say, hey, as a beta zoid, I'm able to love more than one person mm-hmm. or, right. um, but then you know, call me uh, buddy, because I'm not beloved. <laughs> yeah, or just because I'm married in my culture, that just means something else than what it means in your idea of marriage. Right. There could be a whole explanation there, but it yes. was left unsaid. It, it, they put it in the air and then they dropped yes. it. And I'm like, well, which what is romantic? What's platonic? What's your culture? What's the, what's the way of the way you do it? That's a fascinating area to you know discuss and look at and think about, you know, it's pr- provocative and all those things. And yeah. it just, it, again, it didn't it, really it, have it a didn't have to be. Yeah, it didn't have to be, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be yeah. what we traditionally believe right. in, in relationships it's, and structure. And they could mm-hmm. have gone into detail on how it works for, for them. And they did a little bit with the whole naked ritual of marriage and this and that. So that yeah. was unusual. But they wouldn't get into what it what it would mean for the two of them to be together. Does that mean they are in a traditional marriage how we see it, or does that mean she can still be with Riker? Uh, right. It didn't say. Um, but I want to say that the actress who played the woman that uh, Wyatt was drawing in the episode, mm-hmm. Ariana, um, I think. The, yeah, I, I believe mm-hmm. so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, she she delivered a line that I really enjoyed. And it was, I knew you would be this brave. <laughs> and the way she said it, and the way it was like, she, it was such a supportive thing to say to somebody who made that kind of a decision to do that. I thought, oh, those are the kind of com- words of encouragement, of confidence, of support that you want to hear from, from the person that you are with. You right. know, you, you want right. them to support you in that way and say, I knew you could, you know, do this. I knew you would be brave. I knew you would have the courage. And it's like, that means you believe in that person and to that degree. And I felt like 
that was a great way to express how much she believes in him and how much they believe in him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there was actually, apparently they, they did cut out part of that scene, which was afterwards. He was like, Oh, Oh yeah. Bra bravery. That that's why I came on your ship. That that's what it was. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> huh. No, no, I'm kidding. No, they didn't. Cut that. <laughs> Don't believe that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He's like, that's, that's what drove no. me to your ship was yeah, my bravery. Right. That's what it was. Yeah, sure. I but, but I that. thought it was cool because when he got on the ship and he started looking at the pictures, I was like, that's him. At first I was like, is that really him? Or, you know, yeah. cause they had their pictures of him on the wall. Yeah. So, so, you know, cool. it was a, it was a nice um, episode. It wasn't, it didn't, um, rub me the wrong way or anything. There were moments where I wished that Riker handled things differently because it seemed like he pouted a lot. And for a man who's so confident in different situations, especially, you know, when the critical things and life or death and it was all going to go to shit if he doesn't make a move, and he seems to be really confident and all-knowing in those moments. Mm. Yeah, But when it comes to his own relationships, he's, yeah. he seems very insecure and... yes. In childish yes. to, to some degree. Uh, think of think of what it could it would have been like had he been supportive, selfless in this arrangement. Right. Knowing that this was w predestined way before he came onto the picture, a cultural, um, uh, you know, uh, moment, something that he is not in control of. So, how about we support our people instead of? selfishly reacting you know out of out of frustration or jealousy or something that, that would have, would have been... shown a different color uh mm -hmm. you know yeah. to his personality and it would have created yeah. an interesting uh different potential conflict to where maybe he's the supportive one and deanna troy is the one that's having reservations going god look right. how great Riker is about this he yeah. sure is a better guy than this this other guy i just met but yeah, uh I mean, and there's not been, you know, like we were talking about earlier, there's not been this elaborate setup of their relationship at this point. So we really don't know, you know, what is warranted or not at this point. Yeah, well, something was said to the effect of, I hope you can accept this. And, uh, you know, and he said, I'll try. And he walks away. <laughs> and all I could think of was the oh, music. Man. I never want to dance again. Yeah, yeah a little I George Michael. Got no yeah. <laughs> Feeling so, that at the moment. We've got our home run of the day uh, flying in right now uh, because, of course, everybody knows it's preseason baseball, so everybody go support your local baseball teams. Um, <laughs> it's home run of the day. For me, I would say it's Majel Roddenberry for being a, a force of nature, like Denise said, and also whoever it was that did Deanna Troy's hair. I think that was pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah. What about you guys? Home run of the day? Um, wow, let's see. Well, I think we gotta, I gotta stick with, um, uh, with Majel, um, to, you know, I, uh, I think that's, that can be a hard spot to come into, you know, um, we think, oh, it's, you know, my husband's the creator and, you know, this is seamless, but it, it can be a fraught situation you know um there's there's a lot riding on your performance sometimes unfairly more so than usual than a regular guest you know people are kind of looking at you to prove them prove yourself a little bit and i think she handled it and i remember just her on the set handling it like a pro not asking for any special uh, attention, special of anything. She was there, you know, as a team player with all of us. And, you know, that's um, that 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 takes a real a real pro to do that. Mm -hmm. Like she did it. Yeah, I'm going to just um, uh, add to the mix and just say Major as well. She comes in there and it's not easy to come in as a guest star and also the added kind of pressure that everybody knows, you know, who your husband is. And, but she, she handles it like a pro. She's always sweet and generous and uh, loving. Um, 
And yeah, I think she, you know, she carries this episode. Um, I really mm -hmm. enjoyed that plant scene too when she asked her if she liked pets. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and you know, she she gets under your skin just enough where you're saying, oh, she's pulling it off because uh, you know that's what her job is in this, in this episode, and she pulls it off. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say she gets the home run. Absolutely. Awesome. One big right. question. Oh, yeah. you know, yeah. before we go, I, I what, what dawned on me is, you know, here they're set up to go to this beautiful place, Haven, and they never go. That's yeah, right. I thought the same thing. Where's like, the why uh, don't they go? the excursion? Yeah, yeah, they're 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 free of you know they saving they have money. <laughs> I, I mean, my God, they need it. You know, yeah. Captain Tasha Bacchus, especially. You know, Tasha I, should have said. Captain, I, I need like two, I need a 24 hours. Yeah, I need a couple yeah, months. I need a healing. couple months. Healing come exactly. back, come, do a few, a few missions, come back for me. I'll be tan. Yeah, One day yeah. at the spa, two days at exactly. the spa. Exactly. Yeah. It was weird. You're they not didn't... going anywhere. And because I loved the woman that was, you know, the, the sort of uh, person, the ambassador that was coming on the view screen, I thought she yeah. was, the place looked beautiful and, you know, has it, it its reputation precedes it. And, I thought, wow, yeah. go now. Yeah. Go now. That's a Moody yeah. Blues song, I think, 19, <laughs> 1959, right? Something like that. 1959? No, not Moody Blues. 69. It's really old. I, I, we'll have yeah, to look they it up. Weren't, they weren't around in, in the 50s. Moody, The Moody Blues? Maybe it's 69. We'll, we'll yeah, check. You're, I'm older than you, for sure. <laughs> Just by a couple months. Not Come that on, old, no. <laughs> I'm not, I was listening to the Moody Blues in 1959, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, we want to give a very special thanks to uh, Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ Jackson Bay, Bill Victor Arukin, Arukin. Titus Muller, Darlena Marie, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Neil Akasaka. Uh, Melissa nailed that one too a few days ago. The Akasaka <laughs> is pretty good. Justine Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Fultz, my live from Tokyo, Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Heed. Jed Thompson, Luther Haynes Jr., Dr. Courtney Lewis, Beth Ernest, and of course, Dr. Susan V. Gruner and Jason Oaken. We'll be right back with that free-for-all, everybody, so stick around on the seventh rule. Hi there, everybody. This is the free-for-all. It's Bedlam. Look out. Big, big energy here. Um, first things first. We didn't hear any uh, non-appearance mentions in this episode, right? Doc, Mr. Zelo, but I don't think we ever see him, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, here's a question. Do you want to start including Ian Troy, Deanna's dad? Do we see him? We do in video, right? Then, yeah. No, yeah. you're right. Boy, oh boy. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> All right. Catch. So that's the big one. Um, we are joined here, of course, by Melissa Longo. Uh, Dr. Hi. Susan V. Gruner, Dr. Anne Marie Siegel, my live in Tokyo, Faith Howell and friends, Jason Oaken, Dr. Courtney Lewis, Eve England out in Wales, and Chris McGee, the Dark Lord. Uh, he was a Sith <laughs> one time. That was great. Um, real quick, Jake Sisko guesses the IMDb score. Uh, 6.3. Does anybody else have any guesses? Gotta be higher than that. I know. I I'm going to go with 7.3. This wasn't too tough. Guess a 7, because I haven't looked this time. So I'm, I'm going to be bold and guess a 7. <laughs> Eve, did I hear you say, this one wasn't so bad? <laughs> 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 uh Sirach Lofton wins again 6.2. Wow. wow. Magic man. Brutal. Wow. Ruthless. Good. 
Still um, got yeah. it. Still got, got it. Still got it. Even <laughs> after the long cruise. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Melissa Longo, start us yes. off. How are you? What do you think of this episode? I am great, and I liked this episode better than a six point two. Um, <laughs> first, I will. I have to say, Armin. <laughs> that was, it was so fun to see. <laughs> And I have to give a shout out to Tasha's hair. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the it's called the poodle. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's great. Um, but for me, this episode was like a, a warm blanket of nostalgia. Mm. Um, not just because I really got the feeling that I was watching Star Trek, which is a great warm, fuzzy feeling in and of itself. But it also kind of feels, felt like a time capsule of the late 80s and very reflective of the time and um, very demonstrative of how far we've come in just 36 years. I mean, in the broad scheme of things, that's not a very long time. So um, yeah. It, it that was fun for me and and I have to compliment all of the actors in this um, episode. I, I think they're all wonderful. They're superb actors. Um, Marina Sirtis, oh my gosh, her eyes are so expressive. Uh, and then if you've ever met Marina, you know her sass is not the <laughs> same as Deanna Troy's person. You know, she, she, they they definitely got different personalities and then um uh Luwaxana Majel, Barrett Roddenberry gosh she is a great actor too and and everyone's response to her was on point especially Picard who um (laughs) found ways to uh distance himself (laughs) in in funny ways but um and then I also liked that we got some uh, relationship development between Troy and Riker. Uh, that was that was great to see as well. So, yeah, overall, I liked this episode more than a six point two. Mm-hmm. Lots of Aquanet we're talking about in the chat here. <laughs> I, I, definitely eighty seven Aquanet. All right. Uh, Faith Howell is hanging out on the bridge of the Enterprise D. What's up, Faith? (laughs) Do you remember the Aquanet days? And what do you think of this episode? I was too little for the Aquanet days, though I lived (laughs) through them. I was I was uh, immune because I was underage. So. But um, yeah, I I also have fond memories of this episode and and really enjoyed that warm, nostalgic feeling. one thing that hit me a little different watching this time, um, you know, Luwaxana always has that reputation for being the overbearing mother and getting on Picard's nerves. And um, I noticed this time, like, if you watch carefully when um, Deanna says at the beginning, like, makes it clear that she's not quite into this marriage the way, even though she's going to go through with it, she's not, her heart's not in it. Um, Luwaxana moves behind her and her face kind of shows hmm maybe I need to do something and then it almost if you watch it's like she turns on the overbearing to kind of give Troy or Deanna an out because if mm-hmm. she ruins everything with the other family then it's not Deanna's fault and then at the end when um Wyatt has beamed over and made it clear like this is over that's not happening she softens again and so I I never noticed that before. I thought that was very interesting, and I think speaks to the um, Luaxana we see later in DS Nine with Odo and that softer side that she can have. Good point. Yeah. Good um, observation. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't mm-hmm. thought of that. That did remind me, though, that I absolutely positively heard an AD or someone on set flipping the page of a script. And I'll bring that up later. I'll get, cause I listened to it like five times. Just to make sure. Drawing more pictures. And it was definitely <laughs> somebody flipping a page like of a, of a script. Yeah. Um, Mai is live in Tokyo. What's up, Mai? What'd you think of this? I am. I 
thought it was way better than a 6.3, to be honest with you. Um, the, the, the picture that I, that I put up here, Deanna's face, it just it expresses so much there. And if you've ever had to be married against your will or according because of what society thinks you should do, uh, you'll, you would know exactly how that look clearly communicates that feeling. It's soul destroying. And I thought them addressing that in this episode was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. I thought her acting was phenomenal. I thought Majel royalty was ah, refreshing, loved her. Um, but yeah, addressing this topic was something personally for me that was incredible. So I loved it for that, most of all. But I wanted to ask Denise a question, actually. I saw that in this episode, um, Deanna was really coming into her own as a, as a character, and uh, a number of the other characters were doing so. Um, I was wondering, as you're, as you're playing your character, do you get influenced by how others are playing their character? Does that change how you do yours? Um, I would imagine that in an ensemble cast that, that everybody bounces off of each other, but was there any real, w w as this show progressed into these episodes, did you feel more and more influence from the others? And if so, who most of all? Well, you know, again, at this, yes, everybody, everything informs everything, you know, you're, you're, you're like on a, on a, a factual dig, you know, you're going, oh, well, oh, that's, that's her reaction. That's her mother. That's her culture. That so, I get a I get a deeper insight into who she is, um, which then will affect how my my understanding of our relationship can be. So it's 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 just it's just fact finding and layering and. And and lots of that is going on at this point. Um, and um, you know it, but but still, really, the key component is your own writing. What's coming your way? That's still really what is defining all of us at this point. And I'm always I'm always going like like for instance, I had some reaction to. Um, the, at the wedding party that, that you're, you're, you're going to be naked. You know, it was like some sort of like really bold reaction I had, which I, I forgotten completely until watching it just now and thinking, wow, that's, um, wonder, wonder what's going on under that. You know, is she, is she having some, some issue with that? And of course, again, remember we have the rape gangs so everything is is like this, you know, this layered puzzle to me. She's reacting that strongly to to nakedness, but then we have the naked now, and she has the rape mm -hmm. games. And so, where is this all kind of? Um, what is who is this character? So it's all little clues and little, you know, little crumbs that are dropped along the way that begin to, you know, f inform. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, good, good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we've got uh, Dr. Anne Marie Seagull floating <laughs> outside in space. You yeah. uh, have been quoted as saying, Oh my God, that's how you know it's an Anne Marie quote. Oh my God, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Loxana Troy is my favorite character. Is this true? Uh, ever. I love her so much. And I love that we finally get to meet her here. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much I'd say about this episode, but I will just say I give it a 10. It's one of my guilty pleasure favorite episodes. And every time we'd get, we'd circle back in the TNG, like, first of all, the TNG first run and then the TNG reruns, starting with this episode, I just love this run. And I get so happy watching it every time. So it's, <laughs> it's perfect. Perfection. Yeah. So I don't know who these IMDb people are, but I put a 10 on there. <laughs> What do you love most about it? I mean, well, okay. I'm not saying I'm into playing games, but I love how Riker starts really having to like analyze his feelings when Wyatt shows up. And it just shows so much about their relationship that's still being shown in Picard. Like that's such a beautiful thing to see. Um, like, obviously I love the beta's like gift box <laughs> and I just love every second, but Luxana cracks me up so much every time. Love her. 
You know who else cracks us up every time? Dr. <laughs> Susan V. Gruner. How are you, doctor? Uh, what do you think of this one? Okay. I uh, totally agree with Anne Marie. It's a 10. And I think the cast here has it's not finally coalesced, but it's got this episode has everything. I love the subject matter. I love the way they handled it. I thought Marina's performance was fabulous. So was Majel's. Everybody, they, they're just really starting to click. I love one little scene where Picard picks up her luggage, the look on his face, and she says, you can carry my <laughs> luggage. And that was just so well done. So, so simple. He made it look like it was, you know, really heavy. One thing that always pisses me off about movies and TV is when luggage is involved, you know, they're freaking empty. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> if you're carrying heavy luggage, you need two hands and you bend over. Anyhow, anyway, I thought Patrick Stewart did a great job with that fake luggage. But yeah, I give it a 10. It was kind and of like I also called this the big hair episode, the big <laughs> episode. And they use the word naked like a hundred times. I'm exaggerating slightly. <laughs> but the big hair naked episode. I noticed a theme there. Yeah. <laughs> it goes in conjunction. Srock, it was kind of like when uh Quark and Rom were carrying that invisible thing. <gasps> remember? Yeah. And they did Amazing. a great job of actually making they it look did. like they were carrying a heavy yes. thing. I was yeah. very impressed. A cloaking device. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> You know who else always impresses us? Of course, it's Jason Oaken. What's up, Jason? How are you? What do you think of this one? Oh, everyone, I, I do agree, and I'm jumping on the nostalgic bandwagon. I think <laughs> uh, I think visually, uh, this episode probably, along with symbiosis, looks like you know quintessential 1980s. You know, the hair, everything else, and uh, I mean, for the cast, I mean, this was shot right after Code of Honor. It's the next episode that was shot was you know done pretty early so i so i mm. think you know if you look at these two there's such a huge difference from one to the other mm. maybe the cast is recovering from that shock uh <laughs> having gone through it. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and the get to my hair yeah you <laughs> <shocked your head. laughs> yeah, that's exactly right and there's certainly a little bit of sort of this kind of warm fuzzy feeling especially for people who you know love the original series i mean that uh that holodeck uh, planet hell set is just straight out of the original series. It has a sort of feeling about it. I mean, it's, it's just the way it is. I mean, this looks like Star Trek, or at least, you know, mm -hmm. certainly, you know, classic, classic kind of Star Trek. And it was nice to see, and then, you know, to see Majel uh, come in. I mean, uh, you know, Gene tried to give her uh, the part of number one. I think it was not very well written. It was a little stiff and, you know, uh, the studio didn't like it. And, you know, the, you know, the network didn't like it. I think, you know, the uh, Nurse Chapel character was okay. I think, you know, Majel really, really shines as Luxana. I think, you know, they found a character for her and it, it really works very, very well. And it just, you know, a lot of things are kind of, you know, certainly improved from, you know, from, from the episode that came before and, you know, seeing Armin was great um, when he came in and did that little piece. And, uh, you know, and one thing I did notice, I don't know if anybody else did, it's the first appearance of that chair that ends up in Worf's quarters. You know, that uh, with those puffy little things, uh, it, it appears on the uh, on the Tyrellian ship. Ray Burke sits oh. on it and it gets up and goes to the front. That's the first appearance of that chair. Uh, I guess things do get reused quite a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't notice that before. So, so there you go. It's, it really is sort of a... Uh, it kind of got slaughtered uh, later in the, you know, in, in uh, airing order. And, but, you know, it, it's certainly an improvement over the previous ones. And it, again, it's so nostalgic and it's just fun to sit back and watch and, you know, and have a feeling like, you know, you're back in the eighties. Great stuff. Yeah. So for those of you playing a uh, chair bingo, that may have helped you out there. <laughs> I had no idea about that chair at all. Uh, however, We've got another person here, Dr. Courtney Lewis, that's also big in the Luoxana Troy fan club. It seems, is that correct? That is correct. I, I agree with Anne-Marie. I would also give it to 10. Um, just for Luoxana alone. Um, but I, I also found this episode really poignant. Um, for me... <sighs> It was about, or the real undercurrent of, of this for me was 
her wrestling with the the death and absence of her dad. So he's the one who kind of claims this Betazoid tradition um, as a human and has his best friend, who's also a human, brings him into this tradition, right? And this is for reasons that she's not really privy to as a child. So maybe he's worried about her being accepted as Betazoid. We just don't know. Um, but it's a tradition that she runs away from, literally. So she puts this enormous kind of time and distance in between herself and this life that she clearly doesn't want. Um, but then it finds her, right? And in some ways, if she rejects it, she's rejecting her dad, too. Um, and Luxana sees this. I have, I have the same thing in my notes, Faith, of, of thinking, wow, she seems to be extra, extra especially at this dinner, right? Um, so, and also she apologizes, which is not normally her MO, right? Uh, so when they're having that moment, she actually apologizes. So I really like Luxana, the episode, um, but I think I also like this kind of undercurrent of really um, feeling this connection between her and her dad too. Mm-hmm. Great Amen. stuff. Yeah. Welcome, mm -hmm. Courtney. Uh, Thank you so much. Chris McGee, the Dark Lord, is here, the Admiral. What's up, Chris? What are your thoughts on this Never episode? Never going to shake that, am I? <laughs> uh, so I enjoyed this episode. It was a great uh, trip down uh, memory lane for me to see it again, especially in HD. Um, I will say that, you know, before I started doing these free for alls here, and listening to Denise's stories, I never would have noticed all the mentions and all the times whenever nudity or being unclothed or whatever had brought, been brought up or shown on screen for that matter. And so once again, here we are with another episode where it's mentioned several times. Uh, oh. it, it, it's just I never would have noticed this stuff before I started, started joining this. Um, I also loved, I never had noticed before, another thing was the explanation for Troy's accent and a very brief little right. mention in that uh, corridor there where, you know, I apparently she gets it from her father. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, uh, the walks on his previous uh, valet, Mr. Zillow, tried to rid her of it and apparently unsuccessfully. So I never noticed that one before. I thought that was interesting. A couple of last little uh things here <laughs> i thought that little uh sequence at the very beginning with Riker relaxing in his room watching the holographic women <laughs> playing instruments <laughs> seemed a little bit out of place i wondered whether or not maybe they had a few few uh, extra uh special effects you know budget uh, laying around and they said we we need a few extra seconds here on the episode let's <laughs> let's do something with that and uh uh, as far as the um, the the phrase or word of the episode, there were several of them. I love that. Uh, thank you for the drinks uh, that Mr. Hom stated there. Played by so Carol Striken, by the way, uh, who also played the giant in Twin Peaks. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Uh, but my favorite was, of course, Data's wonderful line. Could you please continue the petty bickering? Good stuff. That made me laugh, too. Yeah, uh, I laughed on that. <laughs> All right. Uh, laughing's over. Eve England out in Wales is here. She keeps it serious and straight laced. What do you think of this episode? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, taking aside some of the, the sort of more tropey bits to it that we've obviously seen so far in season one, but there were quite a few things about this episode that I actually thought were, were really cool and I actually got quite drawn into it. Um, I mean, the score was exceptionally lovely, as usual. Um, you know, that's that's been the biggest thing for me just in this season one so far is just how amazing the music is. And I think with the backdrop of the kind of love story, it was particularly amazing this week. But that was not the main point. What I really, really was kind of struck with was how they used this sort of Art Nouveau visual for that um, Haven representative's office. And I just thought, you know, that window that she had behind her would easily have, you know, could be somewhere in, you know, the Paris Metro or Mexico City or somewhere. And then the way she was dressed with that sort of 
drapey mm-hmm. gown and then the hair I thought it was just so sort of you know late um 19th century there so I thought that was really beautiful how how they did that and I thought it kind of aligned really well with this sort of fantasy and mythology that they had with with how amazing the planet was um I also I want to talk about what Luxwana I mean what I did have to find myself chuckling, I just loved how she just wound up Picard the whole time. <laughs> wind and up I was, merchant. Yes. I was like, she is, she is Picard's wind up merchant. And I was like, yes, I love this person. And I was like, and I, I was going to say, I really hope she comes back and winds him up more. And it oh, sounds like she is going to come back and give him some more hell, which I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Um, and then just really finally, I I just love, I love it when they have lots of food and drinks and things in, in Star Trek. And I, I did try and pause the video when they were having that meal just to see what they had on the plate. So I, I don't know, Denise, if you can remember, but that, that big display that they had, that was like a pyramid, looks like it was just cut up pieces of French bread. So I don't know if you can remember what kind of crazy food they used for that buffet, which was just fascinating. Well, I remember um, the enoki mushrooms that, you know, there were big, big wads of weird enoki mushrooms. And I think um, Majel takes a big bite of them. You know, everybody was very... Um, cautious in trying to, you know, we're here, we are having a banquet and a feast, you know, and eating on camera is always dubious at best because, you know, either you, either it's, you know, God knows how long it's been sitting or where it's from or what, you know, you get, you don't want to eat too much, but, but you've got to eat. So, you know, it was, it was really an odd array of all kinds of strange looking things to make it look like, you know, it's Star Trek. So it was mm-hmm. funny, but I just remember those, you know, it, it just brought back such memories seeing those mushrooms. Oh, thank you. you know, it did look really cool. Yeah. Um, so odd Sirach, any uh, thoughts on that? On the mushrooms? No, no thoughts on that. But uh, <laughs> I have thoughts on other things. Uh, my thoughts, I, I like the backdrop of the um, holodeck scene, that kind of purple and the orangey hue behind them when they were sitting on that rock. And it gave me like some kind of Gone with the Wind or something vibes. Um, so I did like the way the set was designed. Um also, I had this kind of weird um, thing in my head when at the end of it, when they said something to the effect of you can keep the chest, you may use it someday. I was thinking that's a perfect opportunity for Lower Decks to reuse the chest as an evil yes. chest yes. In, yes. in one of yeah. the episodes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I don't know if the chest has a name or not, but I, I think it would be a great cameo for a Lower Decks episode. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I, I thought about Lower Decks too when it was the Torellians. I was like, are we going to get them back at some point? Because Lower Decks has conditioned us now to, to like <laughs> expect to them to get the, the deep cuts for us. Yeah, uh, any, any final thoughts for us, Denise, before we go? Well, I just want to um, give a little shout out to Rob Nepper who played um, Wyatt. He is um, a terrific actor who, um, you know, uh, I went on to work with him again in a very interesting show that um, uh, was an early, um, an early Showtime, one of Showtime's first shows now you know remember we're doing this in 87 and there is no showtime at this point so um we went on to do a um a um a show called red shoe diaries with um oh my god david David duchovny was the narrator um he was in the pilot and narrates um, basically this this series, um, this anthology series. And Rob and I played a very, um, very interesting, unusual episode where um, I play a cop that is obsessed with him at our gym. 
And I decide to pull him over one night before a broken tail light. And I arrest him for having this broken tail light. And I take him to my quarters and like hold him hostage and force him to watch me like seduce him. Mm-hmm. It is wow. out there. It is really, you know, um, what's his name? Zalman King wrote and produced this and and directed that particular episode. So it's it's very, you know, it's not Star Trekky, <laughs> not in any means, but it could have fit and in it, this first season. It, you know, it's, it's <laughs> not, but it's kind of it's kind of naked now on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So, but that, you know, there's you. It, it was it was great working with him. We had a terrific um, time. I then went on to uh, guest star on Prison Break, and he was a character on Prison Break. So, you know, you end up kind of recircling a lot of times with actors, and that's mm-hmm. always fun to do. Hey, uh, Just a little footnote. Before we end right there, uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, you did a little research on Robert Nepper and you saw this and you said in just now in our chat that everybody raves about this scene. Is that is that what you uh, we can't hear you, but is that what you saw? Yeah, I was telling you about this last night. I've been reminded that I've heard this mentioned so many times, like in other podcasts reviewing this episode or just talking about TNG in general and everybody just continues to rave about this. So I need to go on YouTube and find it. It sounds amazing. <laughs> seen uh, it. Which scene? This your, scene? Your, your scene no, with Red, the Red Shoe Diaries. Shoes. Oh, the Red Shoe Diaries. Yeah. Oh, really? oh my God. And it, it's even on Memory Alpha. Like wow. as a whole, it gets like a whole paragraph. Yeah. And Melissa, you saw it, you said? Mm-hmm. I've seen it. Yeah. Wow. It is out there, but you all did a great job it 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 evoked what it was supposed to absolutely it's definitely not star trek but um it's edgy and when you were saying it i got i got kathy bates misery vibes Mm. (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's it's definitely along those lines it's it's um you know zalman he you know he really was pushing the boundaries you know in Mm early days of and showtime was you know brave to put this kind of stuff on it was it was pretty racy stuff really you know Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. a lot of people cycled through you know as guest stars i mean i'm sure if we looked at the uh um list you'd you'd go my god i i can't even remember everyone who was in it i think uh lena heady was in an episode really that's really yeah oh wow wow that is cool Uh, so now we know uh, when Riker deletes his Harp Twins program, what he's going to replace it with. Uh, and she diary. Yeah. And uh, real quick, the flipping of the script. I'm positive I heard it during the conference uh, room when they were having their meeting because I was listening to the acoustics and that conference room acoustics weren't quite there in the first season. And suddenly I hear somebody. It was right at 19 minutes and 10 seconds. So go back and check that out. 19 minutes and 10 to 11 seconds. Uh, uh, what is it? He says uh, they're in the conference room and uh, Picard goes up to Data and he says, you're briefing Mr. Data. You know, he says, go back to your briefing and he starts to talk and you just hear someone flipping a page like super loud and very clearly. But anyway, love that kind of stuff because it makes me feel like there's an AD there, just a little too close to that <laughs> overhead mic, you know, getting oh, yeah. in there. Anyway, or somebody. The, it would have been the script supervisor. Could have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah probably. Well, uh, thank you all very much. We got a rollout. Uh, thank you to Melissa Longo, Faith Howell, Jason Oaken, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, my live in Tokyo, Dr. Courtney Lewis, Eve England out in Wales, Chris McGee, for myself, Sirach, Denise and Mr. Aaron Eisenberg. We'd like to thank you all and we will catch you next time. Until then, always, there he is. Always remember (laughs) the seventh rule.